Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. everyone and welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is still Betty Yu and I am a reporter with KPIX5 CBS San Francisco and I'm so delighted to be in your company this evening and have a real live audience because we know we have lived through some uncertain times uh, in the last two years. I was lucky enough to be able to visit Chinatown's museum just this week and check out We Are Bruce Lee, which of course we'll be talking about this evening with its executive director, Justin Hoover. So this museum, of course, it documents a lot of important historical events and new ones, and it also has pretty interesting history itself, which we will go into later this evening. So one year ago, it's hard to believe, I moderated a panel here at the Commonwealth Club virtually. And the topic was how China-based donors and international partners helped US hospitals during the pandemic with supplies such as masks and PPE, as we learned early on in the pandemic. And one of those hospitals was Chinese Hospital right here in San Francisco's Chinatown. And it is um, a little known hospital, but many people don't know that that is where Bruce Lee, international global superstar Bruce Lee was born in 1940. And so this exhibit, We Are Bruce Lee, really explores his legacy and also the museum's legacy and contribution to our community. Today's program, is one of a series of good news stories from the Asia Pacific Affairs Forum, chaired by Ian McQuaig. And this event is live, for reals this time, at the Commonwealth Club's stunning historic building, which we are so privileged to be inside of um, here on the Embarcadero. It's being recorded and live streamed on the Commonwealth Club's YouTube channel. You can watch it and download it later on at commonwealthclub.org. So thank you all for joining us. And we encourage you also to be a member of the club. To learn more, just visit the club's website, which should show up here on the screen, commonwealthclub.org. And with that, I've been waiting to do that. Um, my parents, by the way, always wanted me to go into law. So that is the closest they get to that. Uh, Welcome to our multimedia discussion. It's a very timely discussion about the upcoming Bruce Lee exhibit, the museum's collection, its history, and of course, its future. And so take a look at this video from the Chinese Historical Society of America. that, please join me in welcoming our guest, the museum's executive director, Justin Hoover. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Oops. you. Hi, thank Justin. You. How Hi, are Betty. you? Thank you very well. Thank you. Honored to be here. Thank you so much, everybody in the audience. We are so honored to have you with us today. Before we jump into our discussion, I want to share a little bit about your background. So you took the helm at the museum last February. Mid-pandemic, you've already made a lot of really impactful changes. We know that you're a civic and cultural leader here in the Bay Area beyond. You have deep roots in the Bay Area, in the visual arts and Asian Pacific American community, and you're also from the Bay Area, like myself. Yay. So we have a lot of connections, just like Bruce Lee, to the, to the Bay Area. You came to the museum after working as the founder and director of Collective Action Studio. You served as 
curator of the Chinese American Museum in Los Angeles, and you were the creative director of the Fort Mason Center for Arts and Culture. That's the truncated version of all of your experience and accomplishments. And you're an expert in martial arts, I'm told. Stick around, you may get a demo, um, depending on how many questions maybe we have. Uh, all of that is impressive. Sources also tell me that you have big plans to do some groundbreaking, really creative things in the museum world and kind of take us into this um, new era that we're in and seeing here at Chinatown's museum. I know you want to focus on creating more interactive exhibits mm -hmm. and really attract a new and younger generation and maybe reach people in the virtual world, which we'll also see um, this evening. So before we begin, I do want to remind the audience that if you have a question, feel free. Lillian will be handing them to me later on. And uh, online guests who are joining us, you can post them in the YouTube chat box. We will also make sure to get to those as well. So before we get into the current programming at the museum, I want to talk a little bit about you, Justin. Your background is you're part Asian, you're part Russian, and you're deeply embedded in the arts world. And I think it's very important to not be siloed in, in just one identity group. I'm sure many people here in the audience identify with multiple identity groups. And I think that's sort of your approach to the museum and, and the audience that you hope to reach there. Can you talk about that? Yeah, Betty, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here with you. You know, I, I love watching you on TV, and I'm glad to be here at the Commonwealth Club. What a great institution, so thank, thank you, you all for this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. You know, I grew up, my mother is uh, from Taiwan. Um, she grew up, born and raised in Taiwan. Um, part of my family is Russian as well, so my mother's side goes back a long ways into the Russian-Chinese border region. And so... Forever, I feel like nobody has been singularly one thing in my family. Everybody's half and half, so or part something, part something else. And, uh, you know, when my mother married my father, who's kind of a Caucasian American, you know, that created a family where we all had everything mixed up. So as a young person growing up in the Bay Area, I was, you know, very much embedded in the Chinese American communities. My mother going to our friends' families for uh, homes for various celebrations, for Chinese Sunday school or Chinese after school classes, uh, but also the Russian side of thing, going to see Russian friends. And uh, I was participating in the Russian church as a young boy in San Francisco and in, and in the East Bay. So, you know, to me, it's always been like, you know, especially with language, how you mix it. My grandmother used to have a funny joke and she would play, we played language games. She would always say in Russian, which means in Chinese, Need a mazai nar, but in English means where is your horse? But if you play with the translation in Chinese, <laughs> ma and ma can mean different things. Right, the different intonations. Exactly. So if you translate it knowing Chinese intonations, I could translate to where is your horse or where is your mother, and so only we would kind of get these language games. We play these things all the time, and it it was all mixed up together. So for me, culture <coughs> is something where you can be more than 100% something. You know, sure, maybe blood you can only be 100% one thing. But culturally, you can be more than, any, more than 100%. Math is not the same in the cultural world. So when people say, what are you? Are you Chinese? Are you Taiwanese? Are you Russian? Are you, what are you? I say sometimes. You know, like, you know, when are you this? When are you that? Sometimes I'm this. Sometimes I'm that. It depends on the perspective. It depends on the context. Xie xie. Oh, bouquet. For that. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I really like that you embrace so many different cultures and language. And we didn't even talk about French. You also oh, yeah. Actually, my best language is French, aside from English. I have a French major in college, so I lived in France. And actually, I'm quite good at French. I'm proud to say. My Chinese is pretty poor. I'm embarrassed. My Russian has kind of gone to the wayside a bit. But uh, French oui. somehow, yeah. That's, that's what I got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, we talk about the Chinese Historical Society of America, also known as Chinatown's Museum. But when people think of historical, they, uh. they, they don't exactly think modern at the forefront of what is cutting edge and new. And I know you want to change that. What is the Chinese Historical Society of America? So the Chinese Historical Society was founded in 1963 on Outer Place, and it moved around a little bit. Uh, this was a time of the civil rights movement. It was a time when universities didn't have Asian American studies programs. 
There was no ethnic studies. You know, so some of our founding, um, our forefathers at the, and foremothers at the Historical Society literally wrote the book on this, teaching the first Chinese American history class at SF State, teaching the first ethnic studies class at SF State at UC Berkeley. So CHSA's founding core group of founders started the history of ethnic studies here in California, really. And uh, so the museum has always been at the forefront of contextualizing and historicizing, really collecting, interpreting, preserving, and presenting, and illuminating, ultimately, the history of the Chinese in America and Asian Americans here. So, you know, we are a, a collecting institution. So we have over 20,000 items that tell the history of the Chinese in America, that things like um, railroad tools from the 1800s that tell that Toisanese history of Cantonese labor, all the way to contemporary art, and uh, everything in between. We, have, we actually have a snake in our collection that's an herbal, uh, herbal, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, an herbal um, remedy. Yeah, yes. Right, exactly, so, but it's a full snake. That's kind of our unofficial motto, you know, mascot. And we have just an amazing collection. But we also do publications. We have a publication company. We do exhibitions that, you know, we do um, live events. We do pop-up. We do a bunch of fun stuff. Also, uh, when I was at the museum, you had the actual pen that was used to sign the Chinese Exclusion Act. Correct. So right now on display, we have two items that are quite difficult to look at. Uh, they are also very interesting to look at. Um, oftentimes, that goes hand in hand. But we have the 1902 original document of the Exclusion Act. Now, in 1882, that's when it was signed. The first Exclusion Act was signed. It took 10 years for it to exhaust, and then they had to re-sign it with the Geary Act, which took us to 1902, at which Theodore Roosevelt said, okay, let's make this just permanent and stop with this 10-year nonsense. Let's make it permanent. And he signed it into, into existence. So we have the pen that Theodore Roosevelt signed, the act, the book of the printed act itself, and then the documentation that the uh, white presidential powers at the time used to congratulate themselves for signing it and presenting that this was the actual pen. And 20,000 artifacts, that's pretty hard to believe. Are yeah, I mean, it's an amazing facility that people have been you know, um, connecting with for years that tell that story variously, you know, opera clothes to um, contemporary art. And as we talk about this new era, I thought it'd be a good time for you to show us and take us on a virtual tour. And I believe this is with the technology Matterport. And I know, you have online exhibits, you have traveling exhibits. This is what you would call a virtual tour. Correct. So we have online exhibits, which include um, some really great um, histories of the earthquake, for example. We have a ton of vir visual assets in our collections, such as photographs, scans, audio recordings, that kind of thing. So we tell a lot of stories through the website. And you can go on and check it out at chsa.org. But moving into the 21st century, over the 22nd century, we have to look at what is virtual. So when I moved in as the executive director one year ago, it was the pandemic. We weren't allowed to see each other. I had adopted this um, position as the ED when we couldn't meet physically in the space and thought, okay, well, let's, we have to bring in the Bruce Lee show. That's what I was tasked to do. I was hired to bring in the Bruce Lee show. But we already had an amazing museum show called Chinese American Exclusion Inclusion. It's award winning. It cost a million dollars. It's been there for wow. five years. Yeah, it was an amazing show, but it was, you know, a little bit outdated now. So, you know, I'll take us through a quick look at it right now. This is Matterport. And what I did, the first thing I did was create a 3D scan. I got to give a shout out to Lydia So, who's on the Historic Preservation Committee. She's a commissioner. Yes. Fabulous lady. She's one of our board members and someone I look up to a lot. This was her recommendation to go virtual in this way. So, you know, this is what we have. And you can see it just drops you in right away. And what we did is we, we scanned using the entire um, collection. So you can come up here and you can learn and you can see and you can kind of get a breakout where you can learn, okay, this is the cargo vessel that's in this famous painting here that we have a reproduction of. Um, you can look around and you can see all this stuff. Just take a look at this um, gallery space. When you come and visit the museum, which I hope you do, you'll see how it's changed, it's transformed. But, you know, there's a lot of really fun stuff in here. Um, you can come around this way and see our collection of Jake Lee artworks. This is a really famous um, Chinese American artist who was painting these pictures of Chinese American communities uh, during the 50s and 60s. 
um, what, I, what I especially like about this is if you um, scroll out, you can buy one on our website that's and have it shipped cool. to you. So uh, that's a, uh, you know, uh, uh, selfless you plug. Shopping. You can go shopping on our virtual store. And there was a time when I was younger, I was going to art school. I was like, I'll never sell that. I'll never sell anything. I'm an artist. <laughs> Well, we want to keep the museum doors open, and so we, we promote shopping at the museum. Um, but you know, there's a lot of fun stuff here. You know, you can kind of walk around the whole museum. Well, we just scanned this one gallery, but you can go and explore the entire gallery and see all of the things here. You know, you, if you click on this, you could watch a video on Wong Kim Ark. The Wong Kim Ark case. I won't go into it, but you know, a lot of learning tools here. And then we have some really fun virtual learning tools here, like this one, where I don't know if you all know Frank Wong's miniatures. Classic, right? So this is Frank Wong, you know, with these beautiful miniatures. This is the herb shop. And then what you can do here is you can actually go inside the herb shop by clicking here. And we can do a 3D scan. We did a 3D scan of it here. And let me see if I can go full screen. Wow. Where you can actually now navigate through Frank's miniatures in a way that you could never do before. So we're you know, providing access to our assets in new ways. And you know, you can pause this, you could zoom in, you really wanna see like, the, okay, this is the size of a shoebox wow. in real life. And look at that detail. There's one secret in all of these that uh, every single one of Frank Wong's miniatures um, has a box of C's chocolates in it. <laughs> So you can find it. That but is so cool. It's absolutely incredible to see this. They are not so, edible. Though. No, definitely. They're the size <laughs> of a thumbtack. So um, I'll go here back to the Matterport exhibit. And you know, you can learn all about all of his exhibits. You know, what it looks like in an SRO right here, what it looks like in a family uh, center, what it looks like in um, a real um, laundromat. And we actually know the owners of this exact laundromat. And we just, uh, we just accepted a donation of 250 vinyl records from them. Wow. Um, it's their, it's their, they were musicians. They love their music. So we have this amazing collection of like San Francisco printed Chinese American vinyl records that we have. Beautiful archive of cultural tradition in San Francisco from the Chinese American That's community. amazing. I didn't yeah. even know that existed. I, nobody does, but it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's rare. It's meaningful personal and it can be a great party tool too so we're gonna have some disco uh some uh some some vinyl disc listening parties coming up soon called vinyl from the vault that's awesome yeah and also you mentioned that it takes money to keep the doors open this is one way that these exhibits can take on life after they're officially mm -hmm. closed in the physical real museum world and they can live forever exactly and you know, we have uh, other more contemporary virtual spaces such as this one. And here we see uh, what's called a, uh, this is like the metaverse. You've got heard the, the word metaverse. So we this hear metaverse and NFT. Yeah, right. So days. we don't have any NFTs, but we're working but on that. This is you. Well, this I is me. You. This is my avatar. Um, I'm not named Spawn Point. That's what that, <laughs> I, that's just what that spot is called. Um, so this is my avatar. And this is a metaverse virtual space. And uh, let me navigate this way, it's easier. There is young Bruce in front of Coit Tower. That also, that photo. Exactly, so young Bruce looking at, looking handsome as ever. And uh, what we see here is, uh, now the reason that we built this space out is because, well, we need to get Bruce Lee up, right? And we wanted to build on the museum in a way that was social online. So we haven't gone public with this one yet, but when we do, other people could bring in their avatar. So anybody who logs into the website has an avatar. And then you and I, if you had your avatar there, could speak to each other like you do through Zoom. So you would have a camera that pops up above your head. It shows your real face. The audio, you can see in the bottom corner, there's a little microphone picture, yeah. a little video picture. You can have full-on Zoom-style meetings here with no limit on how many people are here. So we can host classes here. You know, we hope to have these be learning tools and community tools. So we're actually promoting people to come view the show online in our metaverse space. But more importantly, can you shop in this world? That's a great question. So <laughs> we don't have any shopping portals yet. Yet. We, we are working on that. You know, CHSA has been closed for two years and, and God bless the amazing members and donors who have been supporting us to 
not just retain staff, but to bring on new people like myself. And, you know, they've been supporting us through donations. Actually, let me show you over here. If I spin us around and uh, kind of navigate this way, I'll uh, give you a shout out to our uh, sponsorship wall. <laughs> Very nice. So Kenneth Howe and Jerry Yang and Akiko Yamazaki, Jerry and Charlene Lee, Perry Lee, Lawrence Garetti, uh, Lawrence and Garetti Louie, SFAC, the Amazing. NEH, California Humanities, the S San Francisco Office of F Economic and Workforce Development, WADAS, it goes on. These are our funders. We've got to give a shout out to them because they make it Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. They deserve a round of Rose applause. Rose Pack yeah. Foundation, Rose Pack Community Foundation, and all of our donors. These are just our major donors, but we have another 500 members who are supporting the museum. And as you said, the Chinatown Museum was closed for the entirety of two years. It was. You know, that's a rare, yeah, you know. pandemic. Exactly. It was closed. And, you know, people ask, well, why is it closed? We could have gotten open earlier. But we actually took it as an opportunity, right? Every crisis is an opportunity. So we thought, well, you know what? Let's take this as an opportunity to restructure. So they hired me, and we weren't even allowed to reopen because no businesses were open. So we did two things. We opened the parking lot as a public venue because we have like a 20-car parking lot, open air, just a beautiful view of the Transamerica building. It was wonderful sighting, good light. So we've been doing outdoor events in the parking lot. And the second thing we did was um, organize online things like Matterport and online. But we took it as an opportunity which no museum ever gets to do, which is completely reorganize. So all of our collection, we, we organized it, we moved it into, into one place, we've tagged everything, we're, chronic, we're cataloging it. We built new offices, we built new exhibition spaces, we moved our gift shop to a brand new gift shop location across the street, so it's like storefront gift shop. So we've been working to like get the museum not even just to like where it was, but into a brand new space that's powerful and inviting and inclusive. And speaking of that, the Bruce Lee exhibit is, it is uh, inspirational, mm. it's empowering. And I think for a lot of folks who are from the Bay Area, you can learn something that you had, no, you know, you had no idea. Exactly. So, you know, we would love for you to all come to the museum just so you can see a little bit about it. What I've done is I've taken the four main themes of the exhibition, which are the thinker, which you'll see here and behind me. These are drawings and writings by Bruce Lee. Um, these, which you'll see, if we navigate that way, you'd see affirmations. You'd see his, his writing about with the meaning of the yin-yang symbolism and more. You know, we'll look at the unifier. No limitation as limitation. So how is it that we can get out of the silos that uh, have stereotyped us or traditionally isolated our communities? So specifically working with African-American communities. Bruce Lee was beloved by the African-American community, which we can get into more. But, you know, we worked with the African-American Art and Culture Complex, their co-executive directors, Melanie and Melora Green, to co-curate, uh, I'm sorry, they curated an exhibition on the subject of, of black artists, contemporary artists from San Francisco who love and are inspired by Bruce Lee. So that's the unifier section. And then we have the athlete section, which looks at Bruce as more than a martial artist. Like we all obviously know him as a Kung Fu master, but he was so much more than that. He was pioneering new tools. He was innovating. Uh, he was a dancer. He was a, a, he was, um, a health nut. He was a weightlifter. He was a fencer. He was pulling things into his practice of movement that nobody had put together before in a, in a way that was specifically intersectional. You know, so as I say, you know, I'm sometimes one thing, I'm sometimes something else. One thing I'm always saying is that I'm an intersection of many things. And Bruce was too. He was Eurasian. He was from San Francisco. He spent his formative years in Hong Kong. He was a star. He was an athlete. He was a boxer. So the athlete section looks at more than just Kung Fu. One of the coolest things is his actual exercise bench, which you can see. Exactly. He worked out on that bench himself, and, you know, it's a beautiful tool. And then the last one here, which um, for some reason, oh, i got to navigate this way. It's a little hard looking over this way as I'm, like, <laughs> navigating this thing over here, is the visionary. So it looks at Bruce Lee as a business and creative visionary. So people don't realize that to get what he got in life, to become the successful megastar that he was, he couldn't sit back and allow himself to be in the roles that people wanted him to be in. Because people were trying to put him in stereotyping roles, in racist roles. He was getting paid significantly less 
than everybody else on set, including stuntmen, because he was Chinese. You know, in the Green Hornet TV show, the lead actors received like $2,000 per day. Uh, the stuntmen who were white received $500 per day, and Bruce received $450. So he was a, a speaking character who was the lead of that role, of that show, making the least on the show. And um, so, you know, he had to under, you had to understand what he was fighting against. The, the history of stereotyping of Chinese, the rat eating, buck tooth, you know, like demonized form that was used during the exclusionary period to alienate, isolate, and ghettoize the Chinese. He had to overcome that in order to, be, to become a breakout star. So that's what the visionary is all about. So these are the, the four areas that our show would help contextualize the Chinese American history of representation, but also to showcase our most famous Chinese American, Bruce Lee, the master martial artist and, and, and superhero. And one thing that really stuck with me is that he was all these things, but he also gave back. Mm. And as you said, he did not fit the mold of a r traditional Chinese American. And that meant that they didn't want him to teach other races, other genders. So talk about how he still pushed through and gave his gift to others. Yeah, that's brilliant. He was a giving person. He wanted to teach anybody who was willing to put themselves on that path of self-improvement, of enlightenment, really. You know, he was a philosopher, read Krishnamurti, he read Descartes, he read a broad spectrum of people, and he incorporated uh, European Enlightenment philosophers with Chinese traditional philosophers in a way that nobody else had really done before. And some of it's a little bit pithy. You know, it's like, oh, be water, okay, I get it. Like, you know, that's, water can crash and water can flow and can get inside granite and break it. And we say that now, but at the time, nobody was saying that. Nobody who looked Chinese, who was like strong and masculine and sexy was on TV saying these things, right? But, you know, Bruce was. And, you know, he was fighting against the traditional Chinese masters who said Kung Fu should remain for Kung Fu people. You know, there was one other person teaching Kung Fu in America in the 1950s before Bruce. His name was R. Huey Wong in L.A. He came into the you know, U.S. in the 50s through San Francisco. There wasn't enough room with him, it, with, for him in the community in San Francisco. So he went to L.A. and he started teaching. He was the first Chinese person to teach non-Westerners, non-Chinese. But Bruce was the most vocal of it. And he would teach anybody. So his first student was Jesse Glover, an African-American guy who had faced uh, police brutality. You know, he had faced uh, injustice at the hands of the police who needed some sort of self-defense, some sort of security in his body. And Bruce was able to afford the African-American community an opportunity to see themselves also like the Chinese-American community as fighting the colonial preconception of the colored body as being less than of being other, of being inferior. And he did that through martial arts. You know, he was able to take those Western boxing techniques and bring in the kicking of Kung Fu when kicking was totally seen as like, you know, something lesser. You don't do that in Western style. So the cowboy movies, they, they do this ramshackle, haymaker, garbage <laughs> boxing. But Bruce brought this like amazing fluidity and beauty. And really his, his Kung Fu was about empowerment. And so the stories were often somebody who was facing an oppressor using the martial arts as a tool to empower the self to overcome the oppressor. And so the martial arts were a character on the arc, the narrative arc of the individual. So that was a, a, a tool in entertainment that helped people understand the plight of Chinese in real life and African Americans in real life to take Kung Fu, actually to take technically Jeet Kune Do, which is what Bruce Lee taught. He didn't teach Kung Fu, he taught GK, JKD, which was his own martial arts style, to take that as a tool for self-empowerment. And he did so right here in Oakland. Exactly, I mean, he- Many people don't know that. He was, he, exactly, he was, in, he, he was born in San Francisco, moved back to Hong Kong, came back to San Francisco, riled people up, moved to <laughs> Seattle, got his uh, undergraduate degree in philosophy, moved back to San Francisco, lived in Oakland, moved to LA, became a superstar, moved back to Hong Kong, back to LA, that kind of style. But it was in Oakland where he had a studio, but it was in San Francisco at the Great Star Theater, at the Sun Sing Theater, where he would jump up on stage and challenge the traditional masters to step up to his Kung Fu skills his JKD skills, and that's what they didn't like. They didn't like being called out. He used to say that the, um, the Kung Fu masters were, uh, well, what was it? He said that they were 
the traditional, the, the classical mess, excuse me, the classical mess, and that we need to be free, free form, and that really the Kung Fu masters, they close the body off and cramp it into a technique, and that technique blocks the freedom of movement, which is at the, the essence of fighting is the art of moving at the right time, and that's what he said. And he said he didn't teach you to fight or to have self-defense. He taught you to, ha to, to protect yourself through the essence of moving, the art of moving and expressing yourself. And so that was really his art form. It was about empowering one to seek the best self by taking what works and, remo and getting rid of what doesn't. So taking those traditional forms, because he was a master of Kung Fu, of Wing Chun style Kung Fu. But he took the elements of that that worked and he took the elements of fencing that worked. He took the elements of cha-cha-cha, of which he was a master of what worked, because there's a lot of great footwork in that, and awareness, and smile, and pizzazz. Like, yeah. that was a big part of his self-defense was positivity. So, you know, he took what worked, and that was the essence of his martial arts. And he was also 5'7", and 130 pounds. Yeah, he was a small man, yeah. He was, <coughs> if you, we have in the museum, jumpsuits that are high quality replicas of the original screen worn suits. Now the real suits, nobody really knows where they are. Some people say they own them. It's not really able to prove the provenance because after he wore them, they all kind of disappeared and there were many originally. But we have, an, uh, we have a very uh, high quality early 1970s reproduction of the screen worn Game of Death suit and the Chinese Connections suit, the blue suit. And uh, both of these, you know, we have them on mannequins that are exact replicas of Bruce's size and stature. And you look up to, you look at him, and you're like, geez, I could take this guy. <laughs> no way. He had power in him that people couldn't understand. And that was another thing that was difficult. So he, we have a book in our exhibition that's on display that documents th this. He was, you know, as he was breaking out, people didn't expect him to have this. They expected he white America. Like stealth talent. Yeah, white America would invite him to like, show up and be a choreographer for a fight scene with these cowboy western films because they, they knew he was a breakout star, right? And they would say, ah, Bruce Lee, like, who is this China man? Like, forget this guy. And he would line them up. He'd say, all right, you don't think I can do it. Just, here, hold this shield. He'd have, like, a kicking shield, right? And these big, white, burly, brawler, you know, guys would be like, <laughs> ah, whatever. And he would, this one famous story, he, he like, lined them up in front of the swimming pool just because, you know, he knew what he was going to do. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know. So he'd like, he would say, are you ready? And they'd be like, yeah, yeah, And he'd be like, no, 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 get ready. And the guys would be, all right, fine, I'll play this, go play along. And he'd sit down in their stances with the, with the blocking shield. And he would just blast them into the swimming pool, you know, just knock <laughs> them over. So these people had these expectations on what a China man would be. Like a Chinese person, they had the racist view that, you know, as a Chinaman, that he would be small and weak and not take it. And, you know, and he just turned him around and he brought bodybuilding into it. He, he focused on nutrition. He had his own smoothie recipe, you know, really amazing guy. And uh, we didn't even mention the best part of the museum, which is it's the only museum where you can break stuff and That's not pay for it. Exactly, right. <laughs> or get taken off to jail. <laughs> so, uh, or wind up on your TV show at night. Uh, exactly. So <laughs> I news. was able to try my hand at this. You write something that you want to break through. It could be physical or um, an idea. I, I wrote uh, exactly. toxicity. And you write it on a board and then you can try or give it a karate chop. Exactly, right? right. So, you know, I'm a big fan of participatory art. And I became a curator kind of by accident, like I, I, finished my I finished my undergraduate work, I was always an artist, I came home to San Francisco and I saw this great artwork being produced and I thought, man, I could run a gallery, so I, you know, so naive at the time, I would never run a gallery <laughs> now, like a commercial gallery is a whole nother thing, but I was like, let's run this space, because I saw people making art that was just extremely engaging in the sense that it asks you to give some of yourself to it participate in some way. So I ran an, an art space called the Garage Biennale in the early 2000s. I ran for five years, we did monthly shows, but fundamentally it was all about the participation. And that's what I want to bring to this museum too, is that sense of engagement. How do we make sure that somebody has an opportunity to be heard, and then to uh, be able to have their voice seen and heard by others in a meaningful way? So, you know, we developed this way, you know, Bo Bruce said boards don't, punch back, you know, so I think he maybe wouldn't like this one, <laughs> but it's fun, and what we have is a little setup, so if you come to the museum, you can sign a waiver so you don't sue us. I was told I had to do that, and then you can write on it, what is it that blocks you? You know, is it something that you personally are dealing with, something social, 
you know, or is it something like very, you know, fun, like what am I trying to achieve? And it's almost like a form of magic. You know, after you have this action, you've, you've put your mental, you know, wishes into it. You've written it down so you've made the symbol of it. And then you've taken that gesture to transform it. And there's something magical about taking that step, making that action, having something definitive. And Kung Fu, you know, I studied Kung Fu for almost 20 years. You know, to have the ability to do something, you have to be one-hearted. You can't be doing it. You can't be like, do, 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 do. Hey, Mike, like, did you see the show last night? When you're fighting somebody. that's how people walk down the street sometimes. Yeah, and it doesn't work, like, for Kung Fu, but you've got to be focused, right? So we thought, how can we have that example of, like, focusedness that Bruce Lee brought? And we thought, you know, let's break something. And so come by and try and it out. And laugh at the damage. Yeah, the ground. exactly. Then, then say, you know what, I overcame that. And then hopefully you can bring that into your life. We, I, I love that idea. And you spoke to kind of the immersive element that we see at a lot of installations these days and museums around the city and other major cities in the U.S. So tell us about your plans for the museum as we move now into this new era. And I know you've had a couple of events that involve DJs and really bringing new energy into yeah, the space. Yeah, totally. So I've always loved breakdancing. I'm not going to lie about that one because there's a connection there between breakdancing and kung fu. I don't know if people know this one. No. All right, so... Um, Feel free to demo. You want, you want to <laughs> demo? Right, I'll give you a quick demo. So uh, I'm, I'm really short, the kung fu movies of the 70s showed a lot of great like action, right? Um, one of the motions, actually I will do a demo. So one of the motions here is like, it's called the coffee grinder. So you're here and you actually get low and you swing your legs under like that. I've seen that. You know that one? So that actually comes right out straight from the leopard form in the chole foot system and amongst other Shaolin systems. So in my style that I study, you do that move, you fall on your back, you do a helicopter, you do a kick up. There are literal break dance sequences that follow that same kind of you know, movement. So I've always loved Kung Fu movies and break dancing. It's just my thing as a like a guy grew up in the West Coast 80s. Yeah. So at the opening reception, we had Lonnie Pop-Tart Green, known as the Fillmore Kid, who's like the historical like owner of Strutton. And that's like Pop Lockin and the Robotronic, uh, yeah. like the robot, you know, like in the 60s in San Francisco in the Fillmore District, he was embodying Boogaloo as a 10-year-old. And that became strutting, which became the whole West Coast breakdance movement. So we brought Lonnie in for the opening reception with his whole crew of amazing dancers. And we're working with the Hip Hop Congress with um, Rahman Jamal on that one. We're working with the African American Art and Culture Complex for their amazing community of artists. And we're working with folks like Fault Radio, the DJ Collective, to enliven CHSA with the history of Chinese and American, Asian Americans that people don't realize, but that penetrates pop society and popular culture today. Sure. So like DJ, the DJ DJing for Lonnie's set was DJ Qbert, who is the number one scratch DJ from West Coast API hip hop, old school, like 70s and 80s. He was in the houses in the sunset where they're scratching records under the titles of the Scratch Pickles, you know, um, Oh, the Beat Junkies, you know, these amazing groups of Filipino and Chinese American and Japanese American um, DJs, dancers, and collectives that were doing it. And you know what? He was DJing for Lonnie in the Fillmore in the 70s, and they hadn't seen each other since the 80s. Wow. So I have a video on my cell phone where, where Lonnie's like just straight pop locking with DJ Cubert, who's like my idol, in the background. I'm like, how did this even happen? Like, how do we pull this vibe? <laughs> And you can, throw, you can throw a million dollars at something and it'll not be a vibe. But we had a vibe and that's what we're trying to bring together. So, you know, we have, we're, we're trying to roll out a monthly DJ um, series called Vinyl from the Vault. Well, we'll start each one with one of those classical DJ, uh, sorry, classical Chinese American records. We have the record collection at CHSA from the 1800s to today to showcase an original record that would say, we have the record that had the first gong sound that identifies Chinese as otherness by white composers. We have a whole trove of original um, sheet music that we have a pianist working with us to transpose into a virtual, uh, in, into an augmented reality tour. So we're working with sound, we're working with, with, with music, we're working with dance, we're trying to create performances in public space, but really do this in ways that engage a new audience, 
engage a fun, experiential uh, atmosphere and just really hit people in ways they didn't expect. Yeah, and you, you're off to a great start, so Thank we're you, happy Mary. to see it. Um, I want to give the audience a chance to ask you some questions. So I think we have a sampling from Lillian. All right, okay. One question is, as you reimagine the CHSA Museum in new ways and use tech in exciting, powerful modalities, how do you keep the older style archival materials relevant? Thank you for your great handwriting, by the way. That's much better than my reporter chicken scratch. <laughs> so that's a great question. And uh, you know, we have on display historical artifacts and we have reproductions of historical artifacts. So, you know, we have in our exhibition uh, many historical artifacts that are on display. And, you know, the, the methodology of like showing somebody something and saying this is the thing to see is never going to go away. There is a power to an object when it's a unique individual object like the pen of Theodore Roosevelt, which is on display right now. When you see that, you think, geez, like that's amazing that we kept it, you know, and it's maybe a horrible tool, but how can we you know, build on it. So that's never going away. This kind of stuff is just to expand on what we're doing. We're not replacing anything. We still have a historical museum. Right now you can see a, a show of photographic, original photographs from the exclusion era. So really all around 1906. We have original photographs. Like I think there's about 40 or 50 on display right now in our gift shop that you can check out. So that's not going away, but we need to also respond to the new audiences that want to meet online audiences across the nation. We're the Chinese Historical Society of America. And up until now, we've only been really representing local communities. So how do we get beyond San Francisco? We get there through virtual, and we get there through traveling shows, so. Yeah, you broaden the reach, as, yeah. as you've already done. Another question from an audience member, what was most intuitive about porting the exhibit to VR? What was a challenge you encountered? Uh, well, the most intuitive thing was hiring somebody who knows what they're doing to do that one. So um, <laughs> 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 I truly don't have very much to do with how that made it to VR. Um, but the, uh, I mean, it's really hard to transfer to VR because as you can see, you have the scan of it. And the scan of it, I'm going to be honest, it doesn't give you that same sense of being there. And even like the metaverse one gives you more of a sense of being there because like you have these big things and it's kind of fun to see. So. You know, the, the first one, the Metaverse, I'm sorry, the uh, Matterport one is awesome. It is not the best tool for the experience of being online. And we all know, you know, the, f the, the media is the message. You know, so when you're looking at a 3D scan, you're just looking at a scan. You're looking at something that existed that's like secondary. When you see the, mat the Metaverse, the medium, I the message is sociability and custom design for virtual. So the message right off the bat is, let's talk together. And that's what's important, is that the tools, and like with all historical museums, all art, well, that's not true. In the ideal museum, in my perspective, it's a chance to strengthen our society and to build those connections. So I call that bridging. And that's so that you can come in, not with your family, and get tied with your family, although that's great, but that you can come in and meet somebody else that maybe doesn't look like you. Like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bruce Lee's buddy, used to always say, still says, make a friend who doesn't look like you. So how can you bridge those cultures? So the metaverse, you know, is more intuitive in that we can connect with each other socially through that, and that's yeah. what we hope to see. It is social. And um, speaking of Bruce Lee, we have some Bruce Lee questions. How did Bruce Lee end up in the movies? How many did he make? And where can we read his writings about his philosophy and thinking? Okay, so uh, Bruce Lee, he was born in San Francisco because his father was a famous opera star. And his father uh, was at, on tour in San Francisco at that time. And his wife was with him as Bruce's mother, and they happened to be in San Francisco. They were supposed to go home to Hong Kong, but um, they were here, and he was, he was born here. And so his first film was when he was an infant in San Francisco, newly born, like two months old, and he played a female baby in a film um, in San Francisco. And uh, I don't know how many films he's made over the years. It's something around 50, I think, 57 or something like wow. that. I don't know. 
Um, and what was the last question? How did he get into the movies? Uh, 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 where can we read his philosophy? Okay, well, okay, so there's a ton, there's two types of ways you can read his philosophy. One are his books. Like he published a book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, and The Tao of Kung Fu. Um, so you could just buy that on Amazon, or you could probably just like download it from the library online or whatever. I don't know. Um, Add it to the museum. You can buy from our <laughs> gift shop. You can buy his philosophy books at our gift shop. And the third one is um, come to the museum. Because what you'll see is you'll see his handwritten letters. You'll see his um, chief aim letter, which was the letter he wrote in, in like 19, before, like after he finished the Cato series with the Green Hornet, so 67, so 69, I think. He wrote this letter. He was broken. His body was broken. He, was, he had no money. He was disheartened, you know. He didn't have a way back into Hollywood. And so he made this affirmation letter that said, my definite chief aim is that it's, it's 1969 or something. By 1980, I'm going to have $10 million and be the largest, and he's used the word oriental star in the world. Unfortunately, he died before then, but you know, he set, his philosophy was to, to have a clear goal and to set the path for that. And so we have a ton of writing like that in the museum. And if I had the virtual up, I could bring you to see some of it. But the best place, in my opinion, to see and read his writings and his philosophy is at the CHSA Museum. He was a manifester. He was a manifester, exactly, yeah. In many ways, okay, Bruce Lee question. How does Bruce Lee's example help overcome anti-Asian violence? which, of course, we're seeing the uh, resurgence of. Yeah. So Bruce Lee, uh, I think, did a lot for anti-Asian violence because he tried to teach and he did show to the world that th the Chinese and the Asian American person uh, is somebody who needs to be respected and equal. And, you know, that, I think, the first stage to... Uh, anti-Asian violence, I think, is, is information. You know, it's easy to understand how um, the history of violence towards Asians can continue to roll if you forget the history of it, right? So, the, you know, why was there the Atlanta shooting last year? You know, why do they call that a bad day for that gunman, that gunman, right? That was horrible. Yeah. He killed eight Asian women of various ethnicities, Chinese, Vietnamese, I think some Thai, I can't remember. Um, and then the police said it was a bad day. This white guy had a bad day, and he killed a bunch of people. Like, where does that come from? The Page Act of 1975 said no Chinese women were allowed to come to America unless they are of a high moral character. So that's white powers in America saying that all women of Asian ethnicity coming into San Francisco at the time, or, you know, the United States, but mostly San Francisco, were sex objects and just property. And that mentality of positioning uh, a, human, a section of the human race into that framework underlies the public consciousness on how we should treat women of Asian descent. So you see that all over. You know, in the films like Apocalypse Now, Me Love You Long Time, the way that women are perceived through cinema and the way that men in the, the historical Asian um, persuasion are seen through cinema is how Bruce Lee combated that. And that's today, we hope that, you know, we can look at Bruce's legacy and still continue to fight that through knowledge and information. And then, of course, Bruce would love for you, to anybody in our community, elders, youngsters, to physically be safe in our bodies and yeah. study Kung Fu and know themselves. So, you know, um, his first student, Jesse Glover, studied Kung Fu with him. And, you know, in order to combat... Um, police brutality. So we can all physically learn to defend ourselves with Kung Fu. And a lot about Kung Fu is not about fighting, remember. It's about having balance. It's not getting knocked over when someone runs at you. It's having awareness. The first step to fighting, you know, fighting is nothing if you don't know your distance and your timing. You know, you can throw the hardest punch in the world, but if you don't know where your distance is, you can't land it. And if you don't know, the, you don't know when to throw it, you're never going to hit your opponent. Right, it's a true art form. It's a true art form. And Bruce, you know, he would say, I believe he would say that the first stage of fighting is awareness and knowing who's around you. And that's the same thing with our anti-Asian hate. You know, when someone is confronting you, being aware of your situation, removing yourself from that situation, and being safe in your body, and then fighting it through knowledge and information for the public. And we know um, interest in self-defense courses went up during the pandemic as well. It's true, yeah. Uh, tell us about CHSA's plans for exhibits scattered around Chinatown, like at Chinese Hospital. 
Uh, yes, definitely. So Chinese Hospital has been a really amazing institution that has not only weathered the storm of COVID, but been a beacon for how a community can respond to a pandemic. They've been taking in people from across the city as an overflow space for hospitals that are overwhelmed with too many beds. And the total mortality rate in Chinatown has been one of the lowest in any neighborhood because of many reasons, but Chinese Hospital has been central to that. So we're hoping to work with Chinese Hospital to use new technology and participatory engagement tools uh, to tell the story of the people who were part of that heroic effort. You know, so, so much of CHSA is not about dusty old things. It's about telling the stories of the pioneers and champions in our community. And ever since Philip Choi and everybody, people like that started collecting oral histories in 1963, storytelling has been the core of what we do. You know, you can collect as many objects as you want, but if you don't contextualize them, you were asking me earlier, what does a curator do? A curator contextualizes our history or our culture in a way that enables access points for us all to share the same care and love that, that curator has for it. So we hope to work with the you know, Chinese Hospital to be able to do that. Another one is the um, Kublai Khan nightclub. People don't realize that the first Asian American, Chinese American nightclub in the United States was on Grant Avenue just inside of the uh, gates, which is the Kublai Khan, which we have an amazing history of photos from that time period. We, the people who own the Kublai Khan, Kubla Khan Club are I still around. I to say that. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. <laughs> They're still around. They can tell the stories of the space, and we have been working to develop an augmented reality tour where you can go outside the nightclub, hold your phone up, and then see the history of all the photos of the amazingly beautiful dancers, the food being cooked in the kitchen, see the menu of the time, hear the sound, you know. So That's we're trying so cool. to identify sites in Chinatown that tell a story of empowerment, community, diversity, equity, inclusion, and then find ways to access that for the public. We love that and look forward to uh, when that rolls out. Are any of the records being digitized? Yeah, definitely. Um, right now, if you go to CHSA, if you're in our gallery space, you can grab your cell phone and you can scan the QR codes on the wall and those will take you directly to our digital archive. With 20,000 items, it's not easy work. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but we have a selection of maybe a tenth of our collection, which is all online, which you can visit through our website, chsa.org, or come to our museum. Highly recommend you come. Um, you know, we have a discount access right now. It's usually 15 bucks. For the next three months, it's only $10, which nobody should balk at. I, I buy coffee that costs <laughs> more than $10. Especially here in San Francisco. Yeah, especially if you go to Blue Bottle. That's right. So not meaning to plug them, but shoot, man, I'll get a mocha, latte, goat milk, whatever. And you also gave our audience members a first look at the virtual uh, tour of the Bruce Lee exhibit, which exactly. today is the first day yeah. that you unveiled that. Is the Inclusion Exclusion Act exhibit being updated and brought back in the museum's virtual program? I hope so. So yeah, we have that online portal, so anybody can go, members get in for free, otherwise you have to pay the same amount of door fee to get there. Um, if you really want to go, just email me. I'll give you the pass. DM you? Yeah, DM me. <laughs> just send me a text. Just knock on the door and be like, wait, what's the password? Okay, I'll just <laughs> the password is CHSA. So just go on and type it in. I'm just going to give it away right now. <laughs> and truthfully, you gave it to the YouTube crowd, too. Yeah, because truthfully, we're not making any money on it right now. <laughs> and so I'm about to just abandon that pay portal on that one anyway. Okay. But my point is, I would love to get more folks visiting that site and learning how to use it for, for youth and students. But um, yeah, we also want to bring it physically in the gallery. So there's actually a computer there which you could just navigate through it okay. and have it be on site. So we're, these are all things that we just need some time and money on. So, Thank you for that. Um, this is a great question because I know we wanted to touch on this as well. How does the museum contribute to the economic needs of Chinatown post-pandemic? as? we spoke about, it's still going wow. through an existential crisis, socially and economically. Yeah, really. so um, Chinatown is struggling. Doors are closed, windows are empty, you know, there's graffiti on the walls, boards are boarded up, buildings are still there. Uh, Malcolm Young, the director of CCDC, has said that he thinks only like a portion of this community has come back since the pandemic. Um, it's been decimated, and we are offering an opportunity to come to the museum and experience. So come visit us, go to a restaurant, 
We have been, um, you know, we try to create these events monthly where you can come, stay late. Um, we don't bring in food trucks. We don't bring in people from outside Chinatown. We try to make sure that the food and the drink we serve are done in, from companies in Chinatown that we're supporting. So we'll go and we'll buy, you know, 200 meals from Capital or from the iCafe or from Nancy Law at the I Love Boba you know, tea shop on Broadway and Grant, and we'll just have them to resell at the shop. So, you know, we try to make sure that we're supporting local economies and that we're just a site that draws an audience to then venture into San Francisco Chinatown. And that is how you also combat this anti-movement of anti-Asian hate or sentiment or violence, right? You invest in the community. Exactly. You, you know, bringing community in and building community is the first step towards fighting violence, you know? So we've seen countless examples around the world where there will be dark abandoned alleys, there will be empty storefronts. And what happens? You bring in lights, you bring in people, you bring in activities, and you fight all that. And Chinatown is no different. You know, Chinatown has been fighting uh, ex an existential threat since the 1800s when it was founded. And CHSA is there with its other collaborators, uh, you know, we're on the board. There's the new um, Chinatown Media Arts Collaborative, CMAC, that's coming out at 800 Grant Avenue. We're taking over that building. CHSA is a founding member along with CAA, CCDC, the Chinese Culture Center, the Angel Island Immigration Center, CAM Media, and um, I think that's it. I may have one more I missed. But, you know, we're starting a new center there, and we're co-programming. So, you know, this Saturday we're going to be having uh, the Chinatown's first contemporary art festival all throughout Chinatown called Neon Was Never Brighter. The museum will be open, I'll be there, come say hi. In our parking lot, we're gonna have three projections mapped on the walls there by an artist who's currently exhibiting at the Venice Biennale, the highest art festival in the world. Um, you know, her name's Fernanda D'Agostino. So this curated homeschool festival, homegrown festival in Chinatown through a collaborative organization called CMAC is elevating all of the individual organizations and we together are showing that Chinatown as a whole has this amazing viability and power and just come back and enjoy it. You know, we've been always, Chinatown has been always, you know, a space of commerce. Like I'm a Chinese American. My grandma used to bring me there as a kid when I hurt myself for acupuncture. And, you know, I know that the enclaves of where the Chinese Americans live have changed. You know, she bought a house in the sunset. My mother, who's from Taiwan, born and raised, you know, bought a house in Berkeley. And, you know, so the location of where Chinese live is not just Chinatown anymore, but Chinatown still is the beating heart of the Chinese American society for all of the United States. That's where, you know, the first ideas on advancing Chinese uh, and uh, Ch Asian American um, uh, social engagement and, and social justice comes from. And I think it will take institutions and it'll take small businesses, business leaders to help us really recover as we get out of this pandemic and move forward. And I think uh, the museum and all the businesses are really going to lead the way in our recovery. So thank you for being rooted and committed to the Chinatown community. I know we're all happy to see it. Yay. And with that, thank you so much, Justin Hoover, Executive Director of the Chinese Historical Society of America, CHSA. And thank you to our audience members, both here and online, who sent in your questions. I'm glad we were able to get through all of them. I want to share the link where everyone can get tickets to We Are Bruce Lee Under the Sky, One Family, um, or visit chsa.org, right? That's right, chsa.org. The Commonwealth Club's Asian Pacific Affairs Forum will hold its next event on May 11th. And of course, we're, we will be in AAPI Heritage Month. It will be called Inclusion, How Hawaii Protected Its Japanese Americans from Mass Incarceration After Pearl Harbor. Again, that's on May 11th. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California in its 119th year of enlightened discussion is adjourned. I didn't break the glass. <laughs>